I have to um, wonder what Frank said when, uh, when Ian finishes, there will be chaos. <laughs> It has been a wonderful weekend. I think it's great to obviously all be in the same venue as well, where, uh, although next time I do not want to share a room with Scott Tips. <laughs> he, he snores like crazy. <laughs> we were throwing stuff at him in the night to try and... <laughs> so if I fall asleep, it's not because... <laughs> it's just because I wasn't getting sleep out the back. Now, uh, it is the last lecture, um, and if uh, I'm obviously going to try and work through, try and um, keep to my original time schedule, maybe even a little quicker, if I see people starting to go, do a Scott, then um, I'll know that it's sort of time to, uh, to wrap up. But it's been an absolute pleasure to uh, chat with you, to sit down and uh, eat with you, to exchange views. And what's really, really impressive is, of course, that the whole conference has been conducted in a language other than your first language. In fact, for some of you, I know it's your, you know, not even your second language, it's your third language and fourth language, which is really, really impressive for me because, you know, the old saying, a, a person who speaks three languages is trilingual, a person who speaks two languages, of course, is bilingual, and a person who speaks one language is English. <laughs> or American. <laughs> oh no, the French, are getting be- the French are getting a lot better. When I was working with uh, in the oil industry in Paris, I had a colleague, an American, he'd lived in Paris for eight years. And of course, unfortunately, the language of the oil industry is ostensibly English, with the exception of um, West Africa, where it's French, and uh, Latin America, where it's Spanish. But the standing joke in Paris was that this guy could only ever go out with somebody else. He could never go out on his own, because he only knew how to order de beer. So uh, anyway, I'm, it's wonderful that uh, you, know, you guys have um, been able to uh, take on board everything you know, over such a lengthy period of time in a, a language other than your home language. And you know, I know we've had a very, very long day, so I say I will uh, watch out for people nodding off. So as Frank said, you know, it's no, I'm not, uh, I wasn't planning on sort of doing a roundup, but with any event like this, it's really quite remarkable how there is always a common thread and there's no collusion between the speakers, but it always is the case that you know, there's, a, there's a common thread running through. And it just so happens that uh, pretty much every one of the speakers um, has given a, an extensive explanation into some of the things that I'm going to give um, an insight into and to pull it all together. So the pieces of the jigsaw I'm going to bring together and show you how I perceive it to be as a, as a complete picture. And I'm also going to be discussing some things that are outside of my usual realm and you know this is an area that I've had an interest in for quite some time and in fact believe it or not I started talking about this material the non-material stuff before I started talking about the the geopolitical stuff 9-11 in 2003 but what I began to realize was at the time there was really no audience for it and you know I was only speaking with if you like the choir But earlier this year, I did a series of 19 workshops right across the whole of the UK, from Scotland right down to the southwest of England. 19 workshops, over 2,000 people, and what I'm going to do is this presentation is going to be an insight into uh, some of the content of of that workshop. And I think what you'll see is it's very, very different from anything else that you've heard during the course of the weekend, but I, I absolutely am convinced that you will see the significance of what I present here. And, you know, what is also fascinating for me is that now is the time for this material. 10, 12 years ago, it wasn't the time. Now is the time. And what is also fascinating for me is that, you know, there are many, many people now talking about this kind of material. And again, there's no collusion. And everyone talks about it in a different way. Everyone presents it in a different way. Everyone focuses on different aspects of it. But nonetheless, there is a common thread. And once again, this is a, an indication that we're all tapping into something. So the, the title of the talk is, We Must Be Out of Our Minds. Well, of course, everything that we've heard during the course of the weekend, you know, we really must be out of our minds to actually acquiesce to it, to permit it. And as I said yesterday, you know, the three most powerful tools that those who perpetrate this agenda have in their armory are in our control, which is the apathy, the willful ignorance, and the abdication. And this is very important for those who perpetrate the agenda because 
their belief system is very, very different from anything that is in the public domain. And a part of their belief system is that they actually have to tell us what it is that they're planning on doing. They actually have to put it in the public domain. Now, that doesn't mean to say they have to put it on the front page of the newspaper. They can put it out in the most obscure form, but nonetheless, it's out there. And when there is no reaction, they take that as a mandate to then pursue that particular agenda. And actually, what's happening is they're starting to become more arrogant, more aggressive in putting out this information, which is working in two ways, because when it's ignored, it gives them, in their belief system, even more power to implement that agenda, but it's also helping us to be able to wake people up, to get them to or stimulate their own curiosity to take a deeper look at what's actually occurring. So as you'll see, this phrase, we must be out of our minds, is going to have two very different connotations as, uh, between the start of the presentation and the end of the presentation. And what I'm going to show you is the brilliance of the construct, the brilliance with which this agenda is being perpetrated. Take nothing away from them. It's absolutely incredible. But also why they are getting very worried. You know, it's a big new Brzezinski. Two years ago, two, two and a half years ago, in May of 2010, he made two presentations, one at the Council on Foreign Relations and one at the Bilderberger meeting in Sidges. And basically, he made the same statement in each of these meetings. He said, the biggest obstacle to establishing the one world government is the rapid political awakening of the masses. Now, he made another observation 40 years ago, which I'll share with you a bit later, which is also very significant. But nonetheless, this observation, which you can find, it's in the public domain, download on YouTube, but he made a comment, the rapid political awakening is the biggest obstacle to establishing the global government. And they're behind schedule, because the original intention was to have global governance in place by now. And in fact, the original vehicle was going to be global warming. That was going to be the vehicle which they were going to ride on the back of to establish the global governance. But, uh, and Copenhagen, the Copenhagen meetings of December 2009 were supposed to be the forum by which the foundations for global uh, governance was established, all on the basis of you know, the need to come together to fight this pernicious global warming agenda. But of course, something happened just two weeks before that meeting. The Climate Gate emails were released into the public domain, which immediately showed that the whole climate change, well, not the climate change, the global warming agenda was a political construct. And the lies and the deceit of the academic community and the IPCC were laid completely bare. So that was a bit of a spoke in, uh, you know, in, the, in the wheel, if you like, to thwart their quest to establish global governance. So we've been given another opportunity. But something is happening. Something is happening which these guys are very, very concerned about. And it's something that's perhaps not quite so obvious to many people. But as we go through the course of the evening, I think you're going to realize that it's something that you guys are already participating in the process. And an increasing number of people are participating in this process. They don't take a conscious decision to start participating. Something happens, and that's what we're going to be exploring as we go through. So I'm going to start by a little experiment here. Take a look at this pirouetting lady here. Just look at it for a few seconds. Can you raise your hand if you are watching her rotate in a clockwise direction? Okay, can you put your hand up now if you are watching her rotating in an anti-clockwise direction? Okay, can you put your hand up if you've seen her rotating in both directions? And how many people can't see her moving at all? <laughs> ah, you laugh. Well, let me tell you what's going on here. And you can find this on the, on the web, so you can experiment with it yourself. If you haven't seen her rotating in both directions, take your focus from the head 
down to the heel of the foot that appears to go close to the floor here, and then bring your focus back up, and that may actually trigger a change in direction. What's actually happening here? Our optic nerves are linked to both sides of our brain, but only one side of our brain can feed information into our conscious mind at any given moment. So when we are seeing her rotating in a clockwise direction, at that given moment, it is the left side of the brain that is in the dominant role. If we are watching her rotating in an anti-clockwise direction, then that is the right side of the brain that's in the dominant role. Now, if I was to conduct this experiment in, the, in any random high street, the vast majority of people today would swear blind that they can only see her rotating in a clockwise direction. And anything else, any other suggestion is just outrageous because they can only see her rotating in a clockwise direction. And that's because the vast majority of people have been programmed to operate primarily within their left brain. And the right brain has effectively been shut down. And that's what we're going to explore as we go, uh, go through the, uh, the course of the evening. If you can't see her moving at all, there wasn't anybody that put their hand up, was there? If you don't see her moving at all, now I've never seen this, but I am assured that it has happened. In martial arts, the word is tatsudin, the point of perfect balance. And for somebody who has achieved a mental state, maybe the Dalai Lama might uh, sort of get there, but that's about it, I think. But supposedly, if you've achieved the, the perfect balance between the left brain and the right brain, then you can actually see her just stationary. I think I've got a long, long, long way to go before that happens. <laughs> okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a couple of observations. But before I do that, I want to just get a straw poll here. How many people, uh, can I just have the hands up for all the males in the room under the age of 35? Oh, f oh a bit too many. <laughs> okay. I'm going to make a couple of statements here. And let me tell you that if, for the male under the age of 35, it is possible, it is possible that as I make these statements, you may feel a welling up of anger and frustration. And you might want to jump up and say, that's bollocks. And I know this happened because it happened in Australia. Where's Terry? Were you in that uh, presentation? You weren't in that one? Okay. When it was, actually, it was another speaker as well. <laughs> But if you do feel, as I make this statement, as I read out this statement, if you feel this sort of anger welling up in you, don't worry about it, because I will explain why you're feeling that way. Here's the first statement. Your left hemisphere of your brain is a hormonally retarded, perceptually limited, and cognitively impaired version of your right hemisphere. Well, it gets better. <laughs> Your left hemisphere is perceptually dominant. It defines who you are, and it decides who you think you are. The left hemisphere. We tend to refer to the brain. But increasingly, within neuroscience, there is a recognition. Well, in fact, neuroscience, to be honest, neuroscience is effectively dividing into two camps right now. There's the neuroscientists who are the materialists. And these are the neuroscientists, the humanists, if you like, who believe that everything, everything can be explained by reductionist Newtonian science. And that there is absolutely no experience, whilst we are in physical form on this mortal coil, there is actually no experience that cannot be explained. Whereas the non-materialists are starting to say, well, actually, there's a hell of a lot that we can't explain. And what tends to happen is the materialist neuroscientists put a lot of time and effort into trying to demonize and marginalize and dismiss the research of the non-materialists, whilst the non-materialists don't waste their time responding. And so within the non-materialist 
neuroscience camp, there is the increasing recognition that actually to refer to the brain is wrong. It's a misnomer. Because although we have an organ within the cranial cavity, it's actually two organs. The left brain and the right brain divided by the corpus callosum. And the increasing recognition is that these two sides of the brain perform very, very different functions. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that those who think they're the rightful rulers of the planet have actually known this for a long, long time. And so they've made a tremendous effort, a brilliant effort, to keep people locked in to the left brain, the seat of the ego. And a lot of research, the reason I've said about the under 35s, is a lot of research has shown that because of all the programming that takes place, for a lot of the male population, it's only when they get to about the age of 35 that they actually start to move away from the focus on the self and start to recognize that, you know, well, maybe there's other people and maybe they can enjoy life more if they open up to a uh, sort of uh, more open relationship with other people. But up until that point, and it's no fault of their own because it's part of the programming, they focus very much on the self. Now, just to develop this theme of the it defines who you are, let me just ask a question here. When you meet somebody for the first time, perhaps even over the course of the weekend, you've started up a conversation with somebody else, um, but not necessarily here, but elsewhere. When you meet somebody for the first time, after you've exchanged pleasantries, what's normally one of the first questions that actually gets asked? What do you, yeah, what do you work? What is your work? What do you do? What do you do? And what do we answer? <laughs> your job, exactly. The most common answer is your job. So what do you do? And we answer with our job. Isn't it interesting that we actually define ourselves by what enslaves us? Because for the vast majority of people, I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but for the vast majority of people, they're not necessarily, particularly in this climate, they're not necessarily doing a job that they particularly enjoy. They're doing a job because it's a means to providing your income to be actually keep, able to keep a roof over the head and food on the table. What would be a more, perhaps, challenging or interesting question? Who are you? Who are you? Yes, who are you? Has anybody ever tried this? Yeah, you tried it. And what, what reaction did you get? <laughs> Who do you think you are? For asking me the question. <laughs> well, you know, I tried it one time and it was really funny. I said, I said this guy, oh, by the way, by the way, I said, uh, yeah, who are you? And the guy went, um, uh, who, who am I? Um, uh, uh, oh, oh, that's a tough one. Um, and then he told me what he did for a living. So, you know, we, again, we're programmed to actually simply identify the self by what we are employed at. Now, the programming of the, the self, the ego, is very sophisticated because it plays very much on our fears. It wants to create this division between us and everybody else. And it's very, very, very sophisticated. Because when we do meet somebody, hopefully within this group, it's not quite so prevalent, but in the public domain, what tends to happen is we're, as soon as we know we're going to talk to somebody, we're going through some kind of process, either consciously or subconsciously, which is saying, um, uh, am I better dressed than this guy? Is he better dressed than me? Does he look better than me? Does he earn more than me? You know, we're weighing up on a number of levels as to whether we perceive ourselves to be superior or inferior. Whether we're going to look up to this guy or look down to this guy. Or whether we're just going to perceive him as an equal. This is a natural process. Now what is interesting about these observations is that it's unique in the respect that it's a right brain explanation. Because my left brain doesn't feel threatened by the fact that I'm making the comments about the left brain's limitations. But I absolutely relate to what I said, because there's no question that up until, I mean, I gave you the explanation last night, up until I was 34, I was the epitome of the corporate whore. 
in every pretty much sense of the word. You know, and the, and the focus was my career. It was my career that provided the, the lifestyle for my family. And my career came first. And it took this massive wake-up call in, in Kuwait to start the process of shaking me out of that mythology. So this focus, this construct, of course, supports everything we've been talking about here over the last couple of days because it, we want to create a society that encourages people to define themselves by their material possessions. Because what we're trying to create is the good consumer. And of course, what does the marketing, what do the marketing campaigns focus on to try and get us to buy their shit? They focus on our fears. And our fears. And what is the primary fear that they focus on? You're not good enough, exactly. And more, more poignantly, not getting laid. <laughs> and I'm told that applies to both sexes. <laughs> I'm not going to have a debate on that subject. <laughs> I'm going to show you a photograph that was taken, I think it was a week or so, 10 days or so ago, in an area of very, very high unemployment in the UK. An area that is regarded as one of the poorest areas in the UK. A city of Liverpool. It's a lot better than it was, but nonetheless it's still regarded as uh, some way down the line. Look at this. This is the Apple store on the day of the release of the latest iPhone. Not a lot of evidence of poverty or austerity there, is there? Because they're queuing up to buy a 500 pound, what's that, about 5,000 kroner, a 5,000 kroner phone. And this is the result of the sort of phenomenal marketing campaign to launch yeah, the, new, the new iPhone. But well, when I first started to get interested in this subject some years ago, I came across this book, Subliminal Seduction. And it was the, the front cover says, are you being sexually aroused by this picture? Well, <laughs> no, don't think so. Think I'm okay. But the issue here is that whether or not you think you're being sexually aroused, supposedly the marketeers believe that this is the type of image that would get you sexually aroused and therefore get you to buy their products. And I'm going to show you a few ads here. And because I'm obviously sharing this issue with you, you know what you're looking for. So obviously it's going to be pretty blatant. But what you've got to take into account is that the vast majority of people don't look at an ad like they would a piece of art on a wall of an art gallery. It's something that is often just caught in the peripheral vision. And so the ad has to make an impact in that fraction of a second in your peripheral vision. And this is why today a neuroscientist can earn more working with a marketing agency than they can in academic research. And every major marketing agency in the US and the UK employs neuroscientists. Here's the first ad. I think this is for Gap Jeans. Obviously appealing to both sexes, if you wear Gap jeans, you might get laid. Here's something that's a little bit more um, blatant. If, unless you wear Tom Ford aftershave, you're not going to get down her cleavage. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what happened? We have lost everything. Now, if I was a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> ah, we've got the mouse. Ah, there we go. Thank you. You may wave your magic wand. Yes. Or elsewhere. And with this aftershave, you might get real lucky. Yes, it pushes the boundaries, absolutely. 
Well, the marketing industry itself is beginning to recognize this. Here's an advert for a line of clothing, Slate's Clothing. Now, what was really interesting about this particular picture is I walked into a bar in the UK and there was a row of beer pumps. And one of the pumps actually had exactly this as a 3D image on the beer pump, you know, within the, within the pump itself. And it was a row of about six beers. And I spoke to the barman and I said, look, forgive the question, but just out of interest, which one of these six beers do you sell most of? And without hesitation, this was actually Budweiser, without hesitation he said, oh, Budweiser, no question at all. Now, Budweiser may be, I don't drink, but Budweiser may be a good beer. <clears throat> but I would suggest that this image within the 3D context of the pump actually contributed to the, uh, the sales. Here's uh, Samsung computers. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the computer. It has much more to do with the selling. Here's one, fairly close to home across the water although it's not an ad from Sweden, it's an ad from the US, but here's Volvo cars. <laughs> I can see we have a more aware audience here than in a certain other European country where I had to actually explain it. <laughs> now, the next, the next picture I'm going to show you is actually from a cinema. It's in one of these multi-screen complexes. Now, supposedly, and I will take this with a pinch of salt, but supposedly these three ads for films were not deliberately put up in this order. Personally, I think that's a crock. But anyway, consider that that's what the manager said. They weren't deliberately put up in this order. But when these films came into the cinema, these three films grossed as much as all the rest of the screens put together. Now, once again, bear in mind that, you know, when you walk down that long walkway to the doors where you go into all the cinemas, you're not going down the corridor going, oh, yeah, that's, mm -hmm, yeah, I must go see that film. Oh, and that one. You, you are marching down the corridor to get to your cinema to see your, your film. So, once again, these ads are literally catching you in the peripheral vision. Now, here's one from Burger King in the US. Every aspect of it, every aspect from here to here to the BK Super 7 incher. Here's a collage of some of these ads, all from the US. Why? Because it is effectively scientifically proven that sex sells. That sex sells. When I was um, uh, pursuing this line of research with some of the marketing agencies and was talking about this, they were very, very proud of some of the ads that they had designed. And they showed me some of the ads, and every one of the ads supposedly, well, did have, because they eventually pointed out, but had the word sex embedded in the graphic. Now, some of them it was obvious. Some of them I'm staring at it, and I just can't see it, until they pointed it out. And eventually, of course, once I got the, the drift and knew what I was looking for, I could see it straight away. Here's one for bread. Now... In the UK, we have the National Lottery. And this whole issue of morality in marketing came to the fore over this marketing campaign. A particular company, a company called Barnaby Barford, won the contract to market the lottery scratch cards. Now, in the UK, you cannot buy a lottery scratch card until you reach the age of 16. And actually, they're pretty hot on this. And you, if you look under 25, they will actually ask for your ID. But this marketing campaign was aimed at prepubescence, i.e. 9, 10, 11. And what the hell are they doing 
putting a marketing campaign together that markets scratch cards which can't be sold to people unless they're 16 to prepubescence. Now, what I'm going to show you is a graphic. It's not an advert, but this was a graphic that was used uh, on the front page of the article of Marketing Week. The big win, a morality tale. When we actually look at this graphic a little more, what we see is this mandala, mandala of the scratch cards. We have a child, a prepubescent, in the upside down crucifix position, and we have a slightly enhanced National Lottery logo with the 666 clearly on display here. And the article was actually questioning whether or not the marketing industry was starting to go a bit too far. Well, following this article, the marketing industry actually commissioned its own survey into the fall in the standards of morality in marketing. And the, an article written by uh, a British journalist called George Monbiot, um, he brought this uh, report into the public domain. And he took a quote from the report because one of the major contributors to this report was a guy called Rory Sutherland, who was president of the Practitioners in Advertising. And Rory Sutherland says in the report, he said, marketing is either ineffectual or it raises enormous ethical questions every day. It goes on, then with admirable or disturbing candor, Rory Sutherland concluded by saying, I would rather be thought of as evil than useless. Which pretty much says it all, doesn't it? In other words, you know, we are quite happy to prostitute ourselves. And then we wonder why it is that we're in the mess that we're in, you know, and we've heard all the presentations, uh, you know, about the GM foods and the vaccines and the chemtrails. We wonder how it is that this agenda can be perpetrated when, you know, those who are working in these industries must have some idea of what's occurring. Well, they do have some idea of what's occurring. They know what's occurring. Like Rory Sutherland acknowledges, he would rather be thought of as evil than useless. And many people working in the pharmaceutical industry and the biotech industry you know, would rather prostitute themselves in return for their very nice standard of living, thank you, than actually recognize their responsibility to the wider community. And it, especially in times of um, economic hardship, a lot of people think, oh my God, oh my God, I've just got to keep my head down, not rock the boat, and maybe I can keep my salary and my pension. So unfortunately, the vast majority of us have at some time in our lives, and maybe sometimes still do, prostitute ourselves in return for the salary. You know, this is brilliant, because right from the get-go, the effort is made to make sure that we understand that the most important thing is that we are a consumer that we are locked onto that corporate teat. And I'm going to show you um, a poster here from the European Union. It actually appeared in three languages, in French, in Dutch, and in English. The English language version was uh, used in Ireland during the referendums in Ireland. Obviously, the French and the uh, Dutch versions were used in the run-up to their respective referendums on the EU. And you'll remember that the French and the Dutch both voted resoundingly no. They did not want to be uh, signed up to the EU treaty. But their government said, well, thanks for letting us know what you think, but we're going to do it anyway. In Ireland, they couldn't do that because up until the last referendum, their constitution required them to have a referendum to permit the national government to hand over any element of national power to a foreign entity. And these, this advert, the graphic of this advert, is very, very telling at a very, very deep level. I'm not even going to get into this. This is the geometry of Baphomet. This is exactly the same geometry as was used for the iconic Uncle Sam posters, Your Country Needs You, which obviously were used during the First World War. 
It's very clearly illustrating who it is that effectively they are operating under, whose belief system they are operating under. What is this? How do you know that? Okay, at least you didn't tell me that you'd seen the blueprints like somebody did. <laughs> Absolutely, it's based on this. This is Brugel's amazing artwork. And this has effectively become the defined vision of the Tower of Babel. Well, of course, the uh, EU tells us exactly where their loyalties lie because this is the parliamentary building in Strasbourg. And it is based exactly on Brugel's wonderful piece of artwork here. The EU is a Babylonian entity. The Vatican is a Babylonian entity. There are many, many good Christians within the Catholic Church, within the Roman Catholic Church, but there's nothing Christian about the Roman Catholic Church. There's nothing Christian about the Vatican. Why do you think Tony Blair converted to Catholicism so that he can be the first elected president of the EU? This war criminal is being groomed to be the first elected president of the EU because he will do exactly what he's told, as he has proven over the last eight years. This tower in this graphic, represents exactly the same as the separated capstone that I showed you yesterday on the back of the $1 bill on the great, the great seal. This represents the bastion of the few. 